So uh, for this talk, we'll have Patrick Griffiths, and he's going to talk about sandboxing WebKit GTK. Patrick. Uh, so yeah, I'm Patrick from Megalia on the WebKit team. Uh, and so there's been a lot of talk about sandboxing the past few days, specifically Christian's talk, who isn't here at the moment, um, which went into like high level ideas that you want to, to use when sandboxing software. And this is kind of the same ideas just applied to a real project. Um, so as a recap, like what tasks are dangerous that need sandboxing? Um, so anything that parses data from untrusted sources like libxml or librsvg are common exploits. Uh, decoding complex formats like video files, audio files, image files, that sort of thing. And executing arbitrary code like uh, game emulators was mentioned. Um, and those are all things that a web browser does. Um, so a web browser is probably the most important target on your desktop when it comes to security. Uh, it does tons of very dangerous things. You connect to many untrusted sources. Um, so it's, it's very important. Um, so to skip to the end, basically, if you use WebKit GTK in any application, it's a single function call, very simple. Everybody should use this. Uh, right if you make a web context, set sandbox enabled, it should work. Um, there is an exception of if you use custom web extensions, but I'll get to that later. So into the details of how the sandbox is implemented. So again, if you're familiar with Flatpak, um, it's sharing the same ideas that our community has, has built in these past few years. Uh, no reason to reinvent the wheel when we get a lot of it right already. Um, so the first thing you need to do when sandboxing anything is to be multi-process, basically. To separate your work into a different process. And that's what WebKit 2 did. That was a big change from WebKit 1. Um, and so uh, you have your main UI process, which is where you load WebKit. That would be like epiphany. Uh, and then it spawns a few other processes, like a network process, which is, is more of an I.O. process. It does uh, database stuff, network operations, file system operations. Um, but the real important part is the WebKit web processes. For every website you visit, it spawns a new process. So they're all isolated in their own processes. Uh, and we have our own custom IPC solution to communicate between them and share data and whatever. Um, if you were doing this yourself, you'd probably use Dbus, but you know, WebKit's an old project and portable. Um, and so yeah, the web process is where all the scary stuff happens. It's where it parses HTML, it's where it executes JavaScript in their own little VM. It's where it plays back media files, images, whatever. Um, so what do we want sandboxed in those web processes? So file system access is probably the biggest thing. You don't want an exploit to be able to read anything on your file system, of course. Uh, network access, you don't want it to phone home, to send any data, to do anything like that. Uh, Dbus access, even if we block the first two, if you can talk to Dbus, you can you know, easily escape the sandbox. Uh, Pulse audio access, we don't want you to record the microphone or anything. Uh, X11, you can, you know, copy anything on your clipboard or look at other windows or whatever. Uh, and GPU access, potentially there's dangerous memory there or something that is not ideal. Um, so we easily accomplished the first three. Um, we currently allow Pulse audio in. Uh, hopefully Pipewire will be a secure solution for us in the not so distant future. Um, for X11 access, just use Wayland. Uh, if you're on Wayland, we block X11, so hopefully that's secure. And we don't have a solution for GPU access, maybe a virtualized GPU or something in the future. It, it's probably not the biggest deal at the moment. Uh, so the first part is namespaces, which, which again have been discussed already. They're, they're a Linux-specific API to, to isolate processes, basically. Um, and Bubble Wrap came out of the Flatpak project as a simple CLI interface to using that, that API. Um, so here's example usage. Um, uh, you have unshared net and unshared PID, which is two different namespace types. So that process will no longer be able to talk to the network or see other processes running. Uh, and then at that point, you have a, an empty namespace. There's nothing in it. There's no files. There's nothing to execute. 
So you need to mount files into it. Um, so in this example, we have user and etc mounted as read-only. Um, just as an example, ro bind try is something I added. It uh, will just silently fail if the f directory doesn't exist, so you don't have to check ahead of time if 100 directories exist. You can just try them, and if they exist, they exist. If they don't, they don't. Um, and you can mount them into different places. They don't have to be user to user. They can be arbitrary mounts. And then you execute your actual process. I, I recommend uh, Flatpak, a technical walkthrough, uh, spe specifically at that timestamp where he talks at Bubble Wrap. But he, he covers, uh, you know, Bubble Wrap and, and many other of these technologies. So the main difference between us and Flatpak is that we use host data. Uh, Flatpak has the convenience of a runtime being built as a singular kind of image that is just mounted from one place to another, which is really nice and means things probably work. Uh, we don't have that luxury. We're running on the host. Um, so the hardest part of all of this is figuring out what you want from the host in your sandbox and making sure it works. Um, in a literal sense, I think it's an impossible task. Uh, a library can do tons of stupid things, like have an R path to some random directory, or a GTK link can include a, an icon from your SSH directory. Uh, you know, it's all arbitrary data we have no control over. Um, so you just have to have a best effort of including sane directories that make sense, and hope that what you're loading works. Um, so uh, if you're doing this, S trace is your friend, of course. Easy way to track down failing to read files. Uh, LD debug libs, easy way to figure out why a library is loading or not loading. Um, many libraries have environment vari variables to set custom directories to load from. Uh, so you have to be mindful of those. You have to read them, parse them, and, and include them into the sandbox. Uh, and some files are symlinks, and bind mounting doesn't include all those symlinks, so you have to resolve those ahead of time to where they actually point and include those in your, in your sandbox. Um, so some, some data that we include would be like font configuration, GStreamer plugins, Pulse Audio sockets, as many libraries as we can. We're very liberal about just including every library directory. It should be safe, so just bring it on. Um, and detecting if it's running from a development directory and source, GTK themes, icons, that sort of thing. Um, and I recommend just reading the source for this project to see what we do exactly. It's, it's pretty straightforward and simple. Um, and this is probably most, what most projects need. Um, we'll go into more sandboxing, but if you're just running a simple thing like an a icon thumbnailer, it doesn't need more than some libraries and some data. Um, and you'll note at this point we don't have any dbus access, um, so that's where we get to part two. So XDG dbus proxy also came from Flatpak. Uh, we got them to pull it out into their own project so we can use it. Um, and it's a, a, a small service that connects to a dbus proxy, or connects to a, a dbus connection, creates a proxy, and filters talking through it. Um, so this slide might be the only documentation for it that exists on the internet. <laughs> um, so you just, you just give it a, a dbus address. You tell it where to make a socket. Uh, you tell the filter and the talk rules that you want to allow it. So for this example, you can talk to the XDG dbus portal, but nothing else. Everything else will be filtered, denied. It, it won't see anything on uh, the host. Uh, and then you just tell the subprocess to connect to the proxy bus. Um, Flatpakrun.c is probably the best place to see usage of this. Um, there's some details to get right, like the life cycle of the process, but it's, it's pretty straightforward otherwise. Um, and I also, yeah, so we allowed uh, XDG Diva, uh, desktop portal, which was talked about yesterday by Mateus, who's not here, um, which exposes sandbox safe interfaces to software, basically. Um, so that is one thing we allow in, but there's an important detail that uh, the portal reads your root file system and looks for .flatpak info to know if you're a flat pack or if you're a host process. And if that doesn't exist, it assumes you're a host process and potentially allows unsafe things into it. Um, so this is kind of a hack that we're pretending to be a flat pack, um, but it should be a stable format to pretend to be. Um, I believe this is just the flat pack metadata format. 
I don't know. Um, uh, so yeah, and that needs an app ID in it to also determine if you should be allowed to do something. And we just piggyback off G application to, uh, to get your app ID and, and use that. Um, so we don't use a ton of features from the portal, um, but specifically like if you're on Wayland, GTK requires it to get settings like what font you have and what theme you're using and whatnot. Uh, so this is kind of the end overview. Um, so the UI process launches two dbus proxies. Uh, one is for the user session address, which connects to uh, the desktop portal. And then accessibility has its own private dbus connection, so we have to have a second proxy just for that. Um, and then the web process is, as I said, it's a bubble wrap process that mounts the required host data, the required host services, generated flat pack info, few directories that are specific to web kits, and then finally it executes the web process. Um, so I think that covers everything. But um, WebKit has an interface called web extensions, which are basically arbitrary plugins that you can include in the web process. Um, Epiphany, for example, used that for ad blocking used it for password autofills. Um, so since this is arbitrary, it can do anything. Um, so our sandbox will be blocking that. Um, so if you need file system access, we, we give you an API just to add a random path into the sandbox. And you can make it read only or, or writable. Um, but the directory must exist ahead of time. Uh, your web extension might need network access, um, and we just don't allow that. It's not allowed at all. Um, if you want network access, you're going to have to talk to a different process, um, probably over DBus or some custom service that you make. Um, probably not plan to ever allow network access in the process. Um, you may need uh, DBus access. A common thing is you use like G settings. Uh, we do not allow that, simply. Um, uh, for Epiphany's usage, for G settings, what we did was we used the key file backend for G settings. So we simply write all the settings to a file, add that to the sandbox, and that's how we share settings. You don't need dbus, you don't need to read host settings, that's not necessary. Um, another thing Epiphany did was it talked to libsecret to get passwords on the host, which is of course not acceptable. Um, so uh, Epiphany has a private dbus connection between the UI process and the web extension. And uh, what we do is we filter access to the pro passwords. So the, the web extension will ask for passwords, the UI process will be like, should you actually have access to this and safely return just the passwords that are relevant for the website. Um, and I think that covers everything. Um, so any questions? Can you hear me? Oh yeah, okay. Uh, it's probably more a question for Michael, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, any idea of when it's going to arrive in Epiphany? Because it looks really cool. It is in the next stable release of Epiphany. Great, thanks. Yes. Um, so this API is in WebKit GTK 2.26. Um, I'm just wondering uh, if it has any implications for when you uh, use the create a web application a feature in Epiphany. Did we get that working? I believe we did. It should work. I don't know if anyone has tested it. Testing's always good. So, so like a web app is just a regular Epiphany instance with a different profile directory. And uh, Epiphany uses the API to add its profile into the sandbox. So I, I believe it will just work fine. Okay, 
I'll, I'll add a few extra questions. So, uh, so like a common question would be like, does this work in Flatpak? And the answer is no. Flatpak does not allow using namespaces inside of Flatpak. Um, so Flatpak has its own API to create new sandboxes, um, but it's not quite flexible enough for our needs. So if you're using WebKit in Flatpak, you only get Flatpak sandbox, you do not get per process sandboxing. And I guess that's all.